All right, thanks, Seth. And good morning, everybody. Natalie and I are very happy to be here today to talk to you about a topic that's very important to us. We got interested in palliative care because of our professional experiences and the joint belief that pediatric intensivists should be capable and skilled at providing end-of-life care, while also recognizing the indispensable role that all pediatricians involved in the care of an ill or dying um, child can have. And while I have no financial disclosures, I do need to disclose that I am not a palliative care expert. I'm involved in palliative care and end-of-life care in my ICU role, but Dustin Dillon, the Hearts and Hands team, Courageous Kids, and Hospice are really the people who walk the walk every day, and I've learned a lot from all of them. The concept of palliative care started in the 1950s when a physician named Dr. Cicely Saunders articulated the idea of a team of caregivers trained in the care of the dying patient. However, it's really just about the last 20 to 25 years that these concepts have taken hold and experienced remarkable growth in research, education, and practice. I'd like to start with a patient story. I was on a call in the ICU when I was to admit a child named Mary. Mary is a four-year-old girl born with multiple congenital anomalies. The most critical of her anomalies was congenital heart disease. Mary was also a big sister, loved balloons, and was to turn five in two days. She had spent the day prior to her hospital admission celebrating her birthday at home with her friends and family. Mary was in the end stages of heart failure. Unfortunately, she was not a transplant candidate. She was being admitted to the hospital for acute decompensation. I was worried when I walked into Mary's room. She was tachypnic, diaphoretic, and edematous. My immediate thought was intubation. Fortunately, Mary's pediatrician had called me prior to her arrival in the ICU. Now, sometimes as the case, Mary had received care at several different institutions and had a host of subspecialists who had all worked hard to take care of her. At the center of this care team was her pediatrician, a trusted provider that had taken care of Mary and her family since birth. I learned a lot from that, my conversation with that pediatrician and our collaboration was invaluable. Mary's mother knew she was dying and her goal was both to keep Mary comfortable and out of the hospital as much as possible and to feel as a mother, she had done everything she could for Mary to live out as many days as possible. She knew there would be a point at which those two goals would become mutually exclusive and appeared, it appeared that time might be needed. So here's what we hope to cover this hour. A basic explanation of, the, of palliative care principles. A quick look at a timeline of developments relevant to pediatric palliative care. A look at patterns of pediatric life and death a glimpse into parental perspectives on palliative care and into life. I will talk briefly about the state of palliative care education and pediatric training programs. And then we'll shift to, and Natalie will talk about some curricular developments at our hospital and how those pertain to palliative care for the non-ICU, non-palliative care provider. We will conclude with a list of resources for families and caregivers. So before we jump into the principles of palliative care, I want to make a distinction. End-of-life care and palliative care, um, although used sometimes interchangeably, and we will use both terms during this talk, are technically not synonymous. I can see that as end-of-life care, which consists of the period of time prior to death, as concerning the quality of death, and palliative care, in the most simplistic of terms, as concerning the quality of death. Palliative care can occur long before the end-of-life phase. Palliative care certainly encompasses end-of-life care and the patient and family needs during both time periods overlap. The principles of palliative care consist of relieving suffering, suffering across multiple realms, including physical, psychological, social, practic practical, existential, and spiritual, to improve quality and enjoyment of life, not only for the child, but for the family, facilitate informed decision-making by patients, families, and healthcare providers, and assist with ongoing coordination of care among clinicians and various sites of care. It's important to note that palliative care can occur while continuing to seek curative treatment. So my goal for the next section of this talk is to make the relevance of palliative care principles to all pediatricians um, more clear. So I first want to go through a timeline of relevant developments in pediatric palliative care. As I said at the start of the talk, the last 20 years have been extremely important in the growth of, the, of palliative care. In 2000, the AAP released a policy statement, and in that policy statement, they stated, 
All general and subspecialty pediatricians, family physicians, pain specialists, and pediatric surgeons need to become familiar and comfortable with the provision of palliative care to children. In 2003, an important book was published by the Institute of Medicine entitled When Children Die, Improving Palliative and End of Life Care for Children and Their Families. This uh, 670 plus page tome put it in writing how we can do a better job taking care of children and families. And it is an important resource that's still relevant today. I put the website near the top of the slide, and if anyone is interested, this entire book is downloadable for free. Next up, the American Board of Medical Specialties, Specialties officially recognized hospice and palliative care. And this paved the way for the ACGME to start accepting applications for fellowship programs in 2007. So in this new era of specialized palliative care training, the AAP updated their policy on palliative care for children. And guess what? They said the same thing. But they also make some recommendations that recognize the growing field of palliative care as a highly specialized field while still emphasizing the role of primary care providers. They added statements such as, all physicians should recognize how to consult with palliative care specialists and how to explain the role of palliative care as well as after consulting palliative care services, the patient's medical home and all providers should remain fully engaged in the care of the child. And we'll come back to some of the other recommendations in a bit. By 2016, there were 52 certified pediatric palliative care programs in children's hospitals across the country. And at last count, there are 171 hospital and palliative care fellowships. So how is this relevant to all pediatricians? I think the point that the AAP made in its most recent poly policy statement is salient. Um, pediatricians should remain the medical home even when a palliative care team is involved. And this is going to involve conversations about palliative care and represents an opportunity for pediatricians to have a meaningful role in the care of children with life limiting conditions. And furthermore, models of care predict that the number of graduating palliative care fellows would need to double by 2030 to meet the demand for specialty palliative care clinical services. So to understand palliative and end-of-life care needs for children, we need to understand a little bit about the pattern of childhood deaths. Fortunately, death rates among all age groups has been steadily declining um, as depicted by this graphic, which displays the accrued death rate from 1968 to 2010. Children represent about 2% of overall deaths in the United States. About half of all childhood deaths occur in infancy. In 2018, according to the National Vital Statistics Report, there were about 40,000 deaths in the 1 to 24 age group. And unfortunately, vital statistics doesn't break down the age group from 15 to 24. About 20,000 deaths are in infants less than one year of age. Injuries from various Injuries in various forms comprise the top six causes of death, while malignancy, heart disease, congenital anomalies, and chronic respiratory failure comprise the remainder of the list. And you can see the percentages represented by the various causes of death. About 60% of death in childhood um, is accidental. And those are not really the modes of death we're talking about today. It's the children with chronic conditions that represent the greatest opportunity for palliative and end of life care. In an attempt to better characterize hospital deaths, researchers at CHAP reviewed the deaths of all infants and children at their institution over a three year period. The study identified 579 patients who were deceased, 61% were less than one year of age. And as I just mentioned, while accidents or injuries are the cause of 60% of pediatric deaths, 85% of children who died in the hospital had at least one complex chronic condition. The ICU was the most common location of death, and the remainder died in non-ICU settings. The most common way children died in the hospital is shown on this slide. Um, as you can see, the most common type of death was withdrawal life-sustaining technology, while death by neurologic criteria was the least common. The role of palliative care impacted the types of deaths that were seen in the hospital. Of those that died, 32% had received a palliative care consult. Of those involved with the palliative care team, 89% were patients on the oncology ward. Those patients were less likely to experience a co-death and more likely to die as a result of non-escalation in care. So I want to transition now to how children are living. 
As the epidemiology of deaths have shifted and medicine has advanced, the number of children living with chronic medical conditions has increased. It's estimated between 25 and 43 percent of children in the U.S. live with at least one chronic condition and approximately 5 percent live with two or more chronic conditions. So fortunately, as you can see from the, the chart, the top chronic diseases are typically um, ones that don't change survival rates and don't typically um, require palliative care. But also increasing is the number of children living with what can be called chronic complex conditions. Chronic complex conditions, as defined by the Institute of Medicine, are conditions that are likely to last six months or longer and require care by a subspecialist and often include a period of hospitalization. These are the children who might benefit from palliative care. It's difficult to define the number of children living with conditions that warrant palliative care, but in an attempt to reach that number, the Institute of Medicine looked at data on children living with complex chronic conditions, a number which is also on the rise. Among all pediatric deaths, about a third have chronic complex conditions. The point prevalence, meaning on any given day, of children living with life-threatening illnesses is about 45,000. When looking at the annual period prevalence, or the number of cases over, uh, over a period of time, in this case a year, between 175 to 235,000 um, patients are potential palliative care patients. Pediatric patients who die typically experience one of four different patterns, patterns of illness trajectory. These are plotted against quality of life. A represents sudden death, such as trauma or suicide. B represents a steady inexorable decline, um, like Tay-Sachs disease. C represents fluctuating decline, for example, a progressive disease with intermittent crises, such as worsening heart failure, like our patient Mary. And D, a state of constant medical fragility, for example, static neurologic impairment predis predisposing to crisis due to infections and respiratory illnesses. Good end-of-life care, which is illustrated in purple by the shifts in the trajectories, aims to improve quality of life. Life can be very challenging for families with a child with complex, chronic, and potentially life-threatening conditions. This schematic represents a consideration of the issues family face when the issues families face when they have a child with a life-limiting diagnosis or chronic illness. You have the needs of the child, which can be extensive. The implications for the family can be pervasive. Families feel like they're juggling. It can impact finances, both short-term short and long-term, impact marriages, impact work, can cause people to question their faith, impacts the functioning of the home, impacts time management, can impact the siblings and also have an impact on the mental health of providers. This can bring up a number of complex emotions on the part of parents, caregivers, and siblings, including hope, as well as grief, resentment, fear, anger, and the other emotions you can see here. Luckily, there are resources and palliative care teams can help, but the people that may now have to enter the family's life can be overwhelming. And I'm sure in creating this graphic that I've left off some very important factors. How children die directly affects parents' ability to continue their lives and function in their roles. Facilitating a, quote, good death must be a priority for the health of bereaved families. Key factors affect affecting families have been placed in the following categories, suffering. So suffering takes on many forms, um, as I said before, physical, psychological, spiritual, and parents reported lingering angu anguish if they perceived their child suffered at the end of life. Psychological and spiritual suffering on the part of both the child and family can occur. Parents can find themselves emotionally exhausted and siblings can be confused, worried about their brother or sister, and siblings of children who have died can have adjustment disorders and difficulty making friends that lasts for a lifetime. Communication is of utmost importance. Unfortunately, provider family communication can be deficient, problematic, and even damaging. This can be complicated by considering the disclosure to the dying child, how much to tell them, and how much to include them in the decision making. Parents report that end-of-life decisions are the most difficult decisions they will make. And there's not a lot in the way of literature that explores how families make decisions or explore the ability of the parent under distress to make decisions. Inclusion in end-of-life decision making may have a profound impact on the quality of survivorship of bereaved family members. Improving care. 
there are ethical concerns um, that exist about including terminal, terminally ill children and adolescents and their family members in clinical research. It's not easy to study. Care of dying children should not be extrapolated from adult research. There's just too many differences. There needs to be more information on what constitutes, quote, a good death or indicators of quality of life care so that pediatric specific education can be created. Researchers may worry about burdening children and families, yet it must be taken into consideration that sometimes families find value in wanting to help others. Clinician limitations are an issue. An issue. Clinicians have reported a self-perception of being insufficiently prepared to provide end-of-life care to children and to their families, and sometimes rely on trial and error methods to learn such care strategies. I want to share the findings of this study out of Boston. The researchers asked bereaved parents to describe the involvement of their deceased children's primary care physician and the feelings they had about their involvement. Several themes emerged from audio taped interviews of bereaved parents. Most identified limitations in involvement while not believing pediatricians should have done more. Staying in the loop was noted positively, but absence at crucial times was not thought of negatively. Parents didn't speak negatively, negatively or blame pediatricians for any outcome or consider pediatricians indifferent or having abandoned them no matter how min minimal the involvement. They only one wished their PCP had done more relating to sibling bereavement. Parents considered the busyness of primary care practices as a barrier to involvement and spoke of frustrations with poorly informed cross-covering doctors. Parents said for the most part that pediatricians didn't attend funerals, ask about siblings, or check in with parents afterwards. And when pediatricians did do these things, it was very much appreciated. All in all, parents were satisfied by the level of involvement of their pediatricians at the end of life. And I thought about what this means in terms of what we're speaking about, and I was kind of surprised at the results. But I think this is a very small study. There were only 14 pa um, parents who were interviewed. It's in, a, it's in Boston, so it's probably a palliative care, um, resource-rich environment. But in considering the responses, I think just because parents didn't expect more from us, it doesn't mean we can't expect more from ourselves, myself included. The primary position, the, I, I think this still holds true. The primary pediatrician commonly remains the most trusted clinician who knows the child, the family, and the child's course through life. This relationship offers a sense of comfort, safety, and familiarity for most families. Families have unmet needs and so do pediatricians. Often pediatricians lack the knowledge, training, or resources to address these needs. It is challenging con to consider an appropriate curriculum given the rarity of the scenario. In revisiting the AAP 2013 update on palliative care, the AAP did add statements about palliative care education. These are the competencies that the AAP thinks should be covered. And the AAP thinks pediatric palliative care competency should be a core part of medical school, residency, fellowship, and continuing education curricula, as well as pediatric and subspecialty board certifying examinations. And you can see the list of competencies they included. And these are the topics that are covered on the ABP's content specifications. So there seems to be limited recommendations for each tra training program on palliative care and end-of-life educational topics. So it's not surprising then to find that there's no generally accepted or standardized approach to teaching end-of-life care or palliative care concepts to residents. So on to training experience. There were, se there were several studies in regards to training experience that came out within a three-year period um, that I will briefly touch on. And then there was a more recent article that I will also talk about. The 2006 study was at a CHOP. They surveyed all of the residents and discovered that, uh, that residents felt pediatricians should have an important role in palliative care, but residents reported minimal training experience, knowledge, competence, or comfort in vir virtually all areas of palliative care, and that didn't matter what year of training they were in. The two top areas in which residents wanted more education in were pain management and communication. The 2008 study was out of Johns Hopkins, and they again surveyed all their pediatric residents and found that residents were present for a mean of 4.7 deaths. More than 50% of residents had participated in either discussions of withdrawal, symptom management, or completing a death certificate, but less than 50% of residents had received training on, on such. 
President did not feel adequately trained in any of these areas. The 2010 study was out of what is now known as Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. They surveyed all their pediatric residents and fellows. And I looked at the, PD, the resident data only. They found residents were present for a mean of 5.1 deaths. Residents report a minimal amount of training, knowledge, comfort, and competence in palliative care. Most agreed that they would benefit from more training and the top two issues in which they wanted more training similarly were pain management and communication. In a more recent study that was published in 2020 out of Riley Hospital, researchers sur surveyed all their categorical pediatric residents and asked them to rate their comfort level using the, palli the pediatric palliative care questionnaire. Residents were active participants in a mean of 2.8 to 5 deaths per, depending on PGY year, but only about 30% felt their training had prepared them for such. Residents felt uncomfortable with all but three items on a 22-item questionnaire. So to sum, summarize, the residents are caring for children with terminal illnesses. Residents feel unprepared to do so, and a lack of education is primarily the reason. Residents want more education. So to take a look at what is out there in terms of education, there was a literature review conducted in 2014 that sought to summarize the training experiences of residents across the U.S. and Canada. To meet selection criteria for the review, programs had to include education or assessment in either the dom domains of communication skills, pain management, confidence, competency, or knowledge level. Out of 21 interventions describing end-of-life education for residents, only two studies described formal interventions in pediatric residency training programs. And I want to highlight one of the studies. Published in 2002 out of what was then called University of Arizona, which is now Banner Children's Hospital, um, this children described this. I'm sorry. This study described a seminar series for residents on palliative care and end-of-life topics. This was a pretty small study with only eight residents completing the pre- and the post-intervention assessment, but the curriculum was highly received and resulted in residents' self-perceived comfort and skill increasing within all of the six topics that were covered. With such a small study, I think it's hard to draw too many conclusions, but I think the most important piece of this article is a description of the curriculum, which was very rich. What I found particularly remarkable was that this program had facilitators that include subspecialty pediatricians, community pediatricians, an ICU nurse, a psychologist, social workers, a faculty member with a degree in cultural anthropology, and a parent of a deceased child. The seminar's objectives were to cover skills that would serve residents well, whether in general or subspecialty practice. In 2017, the authors of this paper came at exploring the topic of training education from a different direction by surveying all 486 ACGME programs about what education they had in place. This was out of the Children's Hospital of Atlanta. 148 programs responded. Response from general pedi pediatric programs had the greatest response rate, while subspecialists responded um, a range from 10 to 20 percent of the time. 86 percent reported the presence of a hospital and palliative care team, while 45 percent 45 percent reported president presence of a formal curriculum, and that was about 66 programs. The above graph represents the response rate broken down um, by specialty of programs that had a palliative care team, and that's represented um, by the blue bar those that had a palliative care rotation for residents, and that's represented by the red bar, and those that had a palliative care formal curriculum represented by the green bar. Almost all programs had the available availability of a palliative care team at their institution, and HEMONC and general pediatrics were the programs that most frequently reported the presence of a palliative care rotation, and they tied at 59%. The palliative care rotations were, for the most part, not mandatory. Mandatory, 66 programs had a formal curriculum in place. To my personal disappointment, critical care medicine was among the lowest percentage of programs that had access to palliative care rotations and or fam formal palliative care curriculum for trainees. For programs that reported the presence of a palliative care curriculum, the most commonly employed means of education were conferences, bedside teaching, and a review of palliative care medicine consultations. I was surprised that so many programs reported they had a formal palliative care curriculum. Um, but in thinking about this, there may be some selection bias to this survey, and perhaps the directors who place high value on palliative care were more likely to respond. Additionally, greater than 80% of respondents felt a formalized palliative care curriculum would enhance trainees' education, 
and 81% thought a formalized curriculum would help their trainees care for any type of patient. Most programs, however, didn't feel that such a curriculum should be mandatory, as represented in the red bar. The exception to that is the NICU, which thought such a curriculum should be mandatory 62% of the time, but they were also the least likely program to feel their trainees would benefit from formalized education. So several years ago, Natalie and I set out to implement an intellect curriculum for critical care fellows um, at Norton Children's Hospital. We started looking, and our, to our surprise, the literature on teaching palliative care and end-of-life um, care education programs was even more sparse than the available literature for general pediatric residents. So we had the idea to send out a survey to pediatric fellowship program directors and pediatric critical care fellows to primarily explore how fellows learn end-of-life and palliative care concepts, as well as gauge the desire for more education. Secondarily, we also wanted to explore more personal issues that might impact how fellows provide care for and cope with the death of children in their unit. Kelly Lyons, who is now our third year pediatric critical care medicine fellow, joined our team and has been instrumental in survey creation, distribution, data collection, analyzing, and presenting our results. We distributed our surveys online specific to program directors and fellows. We surveyed all programs, which was 96 programs and 654 fellows. We used both questions that generated Likert scale ratings and open-ended questions so that we could do some qualitative research um, with thematic analysis. We had a fair response rate from program directors, but a disappointing response rate from fellows. However, the fellows that did respond uh, were very forthcoming in sharing their personal views and experiences. So I'm gonna share just a few of the highlights from our research. From the program director's response, approximately 25% of programs had a formal curriculum in place. The top three methods for teaching end of life care and palliative care concepts were bedside teaching, followed by lectures, followed by observations. Some of the other responses um, included journal club and online courses. I think the same selection bias applies here. Um, program directors that place high value on palliative care may have been more likely to respond. This chart demonstrates the number of times PICU fellows were directly involved in the end of life care of children, and it's stratified by their year of training. So when we sent out the survey, it was at the beginning of the academic year, and that's important because you'll notice um, that a fair percentage of first year fellows had been directly responsible for the care of the dying child about one to five times. So they presumably were coming to fellowship with this experience, meaning they were doing this during their residency. Um, and expectedly, the number of patients fellows took care of um, increased along with their training year. By the third year, all fellows had been directly responsible for the care of a dying child. When asked if there was a need for more education, 91% of fellows agreed that there was. In contrast, 68% of program directors deemed more education would be beneficial. We then asked in an open-ended format, what topics regarding palliative care and end-of-life care needed a formalized approach? We asked both fellows and program directors. We used the thematic analysis of the open-ended responses and five common themes emerged. Communication. Communication was um, referenced the most commonly and not just patient family communication, but communication with the team and other providers, particularly in situations when there were differences of opinions. Medical management was next, not just symptom control, but how to perform a brain death exam, for example. Cultural awareness, including spiritual dimensions of care. Both thought ethical issues surrounding withdrawal of support would benefit from more education. And then finally, organ donation, including eligibility rules, how to approach, and who is a candidate. So communication, as I mentioned, was talked about a lot. On the topic of communication, we asked fellows how comfortable they were in communicating with families about palliative care and end-of-life issues. You can see that first and second years, the majority of the time had neutral feelings about end-of-life communication. And we discovered that it really took until the third year of fellowship to start to feel more comfortable in regards to communication with families. 
a high level of comfort was never really achieved by a substantial number of trainees. And with that, um, I would like to turn it over to Natalie, who's going to um, speak about the end of life curriculum that we created and speak to the universal nature of some of the topics we cover as it applies to taking care of children and families. Hello everyone, this is Natalie Anderson. Um, I realize you can't see me and we're talking about a heavy topic, so um, I wish that we were all in the same room um, learning about this. Um, and thank you to Ellie for just a great job presenting the research and everything that's been done. The one thing I wanted to present first was what did the curriculum that we created include? So we thought about both the research that we compiled as well as our own experiences as critical care um, providers. And so our lecture series that we provide for our fellows, we do the same lecture series every year. So over the course of your three years of fellowship, you will have the opportunity to be exposed to this up to three times. Um, we, our first lecture is what do we offer here in our program? So our Hearts and Hands program, our chaplain services, child life, expressive therapy, and they're able, those providers, um, Stephanie from Hearts and Hands, Jesse, one of the ICU child, or, um, child life therapists, Robin, they come and they meet the fellows. They introduce themselves. They talk about our memory making and things that we do offer to our families. That way, early on in training, our fellows know what's available to them, even if it would happen to be the middle of the night or a weekend. Also, we do lectures that are um, related to brain death, so the physiology, how to perform the exam. Um, that includes how to educate nurses on what brain death is. We also have um, Kentucky organ, death, um, organ donor affiliates come in and partner with Dr. Porter and they do organ donation and they teach our fellows both about brain death, organ donation, as well as DCD, donation after cardiac death. We, can co we cover compassionate extubation, what that looks like in the ICU, how to do that well. We have a talk on cultural and religious considerations from our chaplain, Robin Hogle, who has done significant work and research in this area. Dr. Dillon provides a symptom management lecture um, for our fellows, which, as you can see from Dr. Peterson's presentation, this is one of the areas that fellows really want to learn more about. We talk about death certificate completion and autopsy. So how do you complete a death certificate? How do you do that accurately? This is a legal document, and so how do you do that appropriately? We talk about how do you lead a family meeting, so the nuances of the communication. Communication, as Ellie said, is highly um, distressing at times to trainees and physicians. And so we sit down and we talk about what that looks like. And then at the end of our curriculum, we have a culmination with a simulation. And so in the pre-COVID era, we had standardized patients from the medical school come and we had um, scripted scenarios for them. And then our fellows would sit down with them and they would deliver these end of life scenarios. And so one of them would be your child is not an ECMO candidate, for instance, in the cardiac ICU. They would, and then during that simulation, the um, actors would actually have different emotions. So some would present with anger, some would present with sadness. And so the fellows were able to work through the nuances of the emotion as they learned how to deliver the information better. And they do this all while receiving real-time feedback from both us as attendings, the actors, and also their co-fellows. Now, why does this matter? And I know it matters for us as critical care fellows, but we're pre or in attendings, but we're presenting this to you. Most of you out there listening are not in the critical care world. And so why does it matter to a pulmonologist or someone who's working in CNY clinic? And um, we found this quote, and I think it's, um, it's very pertinent. Even when a fully resourced palliative care team is present, nothing can replace a relationship the patient and family have with the primary pediatrician. And so oftentimes as a primary care pediatrician or the subspecialist, I can speak for our cardiologists, you know, they follow these children from birth. And you have established this relationship um, far before they will ever step into the doors of critical care units. And I would also argue that not all end-of-life conversations or palliative care conversations relate to the actual death of the child. And so there are times in your clinics when you're going to be talking about very hard subjects, such as autism or working up for cancer, or how do you talk to the family about the potential need for tracheostomy. 
to? What if you're concerned about type 1 diabetes? What if the child has been abused? What if you're concerned about some kind of mental health diagnoses? While those aren't actual physical death of a child, there is the end of the life that the parent thought the child was going to have. And there is a sense of grief in that. And so I think by not acknowledging those pieces of what non-hospital based or non-ICU based physicians deal with um, is maybe um, something that we don't do as good a job of in the inpatient world and the ICU world, because those are hard conversations that I will likely never have to have in the critical care unit. But I imagine that if I were having to have them would have a great deal of stress about doing so. And with that in mind, I wanted to offer pieces of what we educate our fellows on to you guys listening so that you could use those in your practices. I highlighted the two that I think are most relevant. Um, most people in the outpatient world won't be doing brain death exams. Dear Lord, I hope not. Um, but I do think covering some cultural religious nuances as well as some skills for talking to families um, it are definitely useful. So first, as it relates to the cultural and religious considerations, I think this is a, a really important and not um, short topic. However, I don't have much time and there are people who are much more gifted at talking about this. If you were ever interested or had questions about this, I will put in a plug for our chaplain Robin. She does a great job with our trainees about this and actually meets our families right where they are, regardless of their um, religious backgrounds. And so I highlighted some of the nuances within religion that we see here in our community. So, you know, people of the Muslim faith, so there are different belief systems that they have regarding burial, oftentimes wanting burial to occur before sundown on the day of death. There is oftentimes a hesitancy to proceed with autopsy due to different beliefs of having the organs within the body at at the burial. We have had to navigate, and as anybody of any faith would know, that even within one faith, there are different beliefs within that. And so if you maybe grew up in one area of the world, the version of Islam that you practice may be a little bit different than someone else. And I think as a provider, being open to learning about that and providing, it lets you provide the best care for your patient. We've all learned about um, the concerns with Jehovah Witness and um, giving transfusions and blood products. And I think just listening to the family and learning more, one thing I learned quite um, well a few years ago is early in my attending career was there was a family, excuse me, who had was a Jehovah Witness. And the mother was not trying to prevent her child from receiving blood. And she was okay that if we went to the courts to get access to the blood for her, she just did not want it to have to be her decision. And so she actually wasn't obstructing care, but and she very much wanted her child to receive care. And I think sometimes we have to set aside our preconceived notions of that religion or that culture in order to see what the family really wants for their children. The Amish community brings on a very special and unique um, set of values. Like I said, um, within the Muslim faith, the Amish community has a whole variety um, of different belief systems from our patients who have electricity and receive heart transplants to our patients who don't believe brain death to be a thing. And so I think being very open to that and just listening to them rather than having a preconceived set of beliefs about the Amish community. And then briefly, oftentimes in many Japanese cultures, there's not um, a belief that brain death is a true diagnosis. And so a lot of what we have learned on how to care for the brain dead body comes from um, research out of Japan. And then lastly, even within our own communities, the concept of a miracle, so the miracle will heal the child um, while your child may be hooked up to nitric oxide, ECMO, um, renal replacement therapy. And you're looking there and you're saying, well, we are preventing, you know, we are the miracle with our machines. And just learning how to listen to those families and communicate with them can be um, oftentimes a very difficult thing to do. But I think most importantly, it's important to remember this, and I think this goes back to just being a person before it is being a doctor, but sometimes it's very hard in our hierarchical medicine constructs to remember that when our culture and our grief doesn't look like someone else's, that doesn't mean it's unacceptable, and it doesn't mean that it's wrong. And I'll pause right there. To, I want you to read that again and think about that. Just because someone grieves differently than the way that you grew up grieving or the way you witness grief does not mean that their grief is any different, any less or any more than your own. And trying to sit with that and respect that, 
I think our ER partners could definitely attest to this, that they see grief very acutely when someone dies in the emergency department. And some people of some cultures may stand and not say a word, and you would perceive them to be cold if you weren't thinking that maybe they are grieving differently, or someone may, quote, fall out in the middle of the ER, and it'd be a very loud demonstrative thing. And somebody might think, well, they're grieving more. And I don't think either is true. And I think being very aware of that within ourselves and giving people space to grieve is an important process. Next and very importantly is talking to families. So I think some important things to highlight within this are first preparing. Now preparing, setting and disclosure to the patient, I think all go together. But I say this and um, it's a very important thing and may seem very silly. And for those of you in the outpatient world who have longstanding relationships with families, may not imagine how this could ever happen, but what if you forgot the gender of the patient or you forgot the name of the patient? That might immediately cause distrust between you and the family that you're getting ready to have a hard conversation with. And so make sure what's the patient's name? What are the parents' names? What's the child's gender? You're, you may be in the ER and you're walking into the room blindly, but do your best to try to find those things. And then what room are you going to do this in? Has the family disclosed this to their child? So they may not want to have this conversation at the bedside. And so even if one of your colleagues starts saying something that may be related to this end of life conversation, even stopping the conversation saying, hey, would you like to step outside? Or, you know, I'm sorry, would you like me to find another quieter location for us to have this conversation? Definitely could set up a more a trust building environment and a more quiet and uh, an environment that allows the family to process what you're about to tell them. And then next are the harder parts of the communication. So the listening versus hearing. Oftentimes in medicine, I believe we come into a conversation, whether it's about end of life or if it's about, you know, what your echo result is. And we have a set of information that we are going to deliver. And we feel like we have to deliver that information, period. However, we don't always listen to what the family is trying to tell us. We're hearing the words that are coming out of their mouth because we have to get to the information that we need to deliver. When in fact, what they're trying to tell us is, well, I'm not ready for that information. I didn't know that you were gonna talk to me that my, children, that my child might die. And so then delivering all the information you have prepared may not be the right time to do so. And I think that is a developed skill, but one that we all definitely should work on in order to communicate better with our families. And then next is the comfort with silence. I think parenting teenagers has improved my ability to have comfort with silence. However, I think sitting there and waiting for the family when it's really uncomfortable. And we all hear this and we know it, but when you have to sit there after telling a family that their child is brain dead and waiting in silence as they process that, process that is very difficult. And I think in any communication, like I mentioned earlier, I'm concerned that your child may have autism. And then sitting in that silence and trying not to fill it with words that make you more comfortable, but may not give the family time to process. And then I think maybe the most important is the vulnerability to have the conversation. So you're in the clinic and you have a relationship with this family and you know that this child will not survive to adulthood. You know that this child may need a tracheostomy or may need a baclofen pump or whatever it happens to be for that particular scenario. And you could go to your well child check and you could give your MMR vaccine and talk about healthy diets and all of those things that I'm very lucky to have a good pediatrician who does that for our family. However, I think to have the vulnerability to say, hey, have you thought about a DNR? Have you thought about what happens if your child were to get COVID and need to be intubated? Do you think that that's what you would want for them? What are kind of your goals as a family? Have you talked about this? And I think doing so, it sets the family up for a better prepared situation where they to be admitted to me in the ICU. You have already set the stage for, you make my job easier and I think you make the family's life better by having had that conversation. But by, in saying that, I'm also acknowledging to have that conversation takes immense courage and vulnerability because you're risking your relationship with the family by putting that out there. And, but I would encourage us all to do so. It doesn't mean it's easy, it, but it's all, sometimes the right thing and the easy thing are not the same thing. And then lastly, providing resources to the family. So if you're in the clinic and you start having these conversations, having the resources to give them to think about this. What does it look like to use courageous kids for palliative care? What does it look like to have mental health support? And then a time frame, a time frame to follow up. So 
you know, thanks for talking to me about this. I really think maybe at our next checkup in six months, we could talk a little bit more. Now for us in the emergency department or the PICU, it may be, I'm going to be back here in 20 minutes. I wanted to give you all time to kind of think of some questions, process, and then step away. For me as a physician, I like to get out of the room as early as possible because I think sometimes our presence perpetuates the need for an answer. And oftentimes giving the family space with our hearts and hands team or our chaplain and within their own family gives them time to process that and get to questions that they may have for us. And then so what are our end of life resources? So I told you all of this heavy information and I'm encouraging you to use that information to talk to families but then I, I have to give you resources with which to do that. So within our children's hospital here currently, we have our hearts and hands team of Stephanie and Christy, um, two of our nurses who are fantastic. They try to see patients every single day of the week um, and work very hard to do so. We have an expressive therapist and multiple child life therapists and now therapy dogs. We have an ethics committee um, who has multiple, a few ICU physicians trained ethicists with um, Dr. Knapp and Dr. Brothers and who are very willing to accept calls and questions from the outside community. They've helped CPS before with ethical decisions. And then as Dr. Peterson mentioned, um, Dustin Dillon is our palliative care board certified um, doctor who spends time with us on Mondays. And then we also have our chaplain services who do a great service to our hospital. So outside of Norton Children's, we have the Courageous Kids program that has two arms for children, both a palliative care and a hospice arm. So the palliative care arm, there's collaboration with you, the child's medical home, whereas in the hospice program, there is the expectation that the child will live less than six months, and the hospice program takes over primary care for that child. Now, that doesn't mean that if your patient is enrolled in those programs, they can't continue to seek curative treatments. However, the, they provide so many fantastic resources for these families that I wasn't even aware of until I got further into my ICU training, but they have chaplains, mental health resources, case managers, social workers. They go to the children's homes. When the children get admitted to the hospital, they work very closely with them. And so I would encourage you, if you have any interest in providing this resource for your family, to reach out to them or even to one of us to get connected with them. Other community resources include Buildis Club um, for cancer diagnoses, and then for any of you who trained here in the last, I don't know, 10 to 12 years, you should be familiar with Camp Courageous Kids. Um, we used to do our intern retreats at this location outside of Bowling Green, and they offer family and summer camps, which may sound, um, I don't know, silly or nominal. However, for a kid who has any kind of chronic medical issue, they already feel different. And so if they're able to go and do normal kid things with kids who are like them, it can provide a sense of normalcy for them and improve their mental health, as well as give their families maybe this sense of my kid is like someone else and we're not so different. And so they have camps that focus on congenital heart disease, cystic fibrosis, even our patients who have severe physical limitations that require wheelchairs, trachs, vents, can go and ride horses and go swimming. And they have physicians and nurses on site who care for them. So what are we doing moving forward? What are some local initiatives that we have going? Um, Dr. Peterson focused a lot on some of the residency education and perception, both of the trainees and of program directors. So here within our own program, we do have um, a robust curriculum in terms of our education for all of our science stuff, but within our um, end of life um, piece of this, we have ethics and medical decision making lectures given by our ethics trained physicians. And then we also have the communication series that our residents receive. The communication series, while not directly tied to end of life or palliative care, teaches residents how to be better communicators as a whole, which I would then argue makes them better at communicating with families in hard situations. Within the hospital side and the nursing side, we have what's called the butterfly committee. And so that is composed of um, nurses within the ICUs who work on memory making and how to improve the patient experience. We have our hearts and hands team and grow, growing palliative care developments within the children's hospital. And then um, looking ahead, so what are we doing now? So within the residency program, I think, think for me thinking of goals for our residency program and how do we make this better, you know, they have a curriculum that helps our residents pass boards, but what could we do that gives them a 
it may be an improved comfort level on having these conversations and dealing with families at end of life. And do we need to assume some of that curriculum into the ICU rotation or the NICU or ER and these um, cardiology hemong? Do we all work together to put these lectures um, in a cohesive curriculum for the residents that they receive on rotation so they're able to merge the didactic with real patient care? Um, I don't know. I think that's a place that we dream and we look forward. As with the fellowship programs, you know, we are doing this here in the critical care division, and it's been well received by our fellows. But do we make this something that it exposes all fellows throughout Norton Children's to this? I'm asking, you know, our Palm fellows to have conversations with CF patients or endocrine fellows to talk to patients with diabetes, yet we're not giving them the same resources that I've provided to our critical care fellows. So do we create a curriculum that incorporates all these fellows so that they get all of this information that may, they may not need to have the brain death lecture, but they could definitely benefit from simulated conversations or how to talk to families. I think there's some local opportunities to incorporate simulation based practice within maybe half day seminars or things like that. Um, I asked Robin, our chaplain, what other resources do you provide families at end of life? And she said, you know, I did. She went out in the community and looked for what she could find and really was disappointed that she just didn't find a lot. And which has given her motivation to say, okay, do I need to start something for our bereaved families that is a long term support group that may benefit them? And then lastly, I think improved access for mental health services for our families who both lose children or who have, had, you know, gone through significant events. I think about um, my very best friend, who many of you cared for her son, and he had cancer and he is now in remission. But she and her family still really struggled after he went home. Every time they go to the clinic, they worry, is this the time he's going to go back? Every blood draw, every cough, every congestion, every rash. Is this rash another? Is this petechiae? And so she came to me and she said, I, we need to go to therapy. And thankfully, I was able to reach out to Dustin Dillon and connect her with a therapist who had dealt with medical trauma. But not every family has the luxury of an intensive care doctor as their best friend who knows a palliative care doctor. And so how do we provide these resources for all of our families, not just the ones with better access? And then lastly, I wanted to provide you all with contact information. So both for myself and Ellie, um, this is the website for Camp Courageous Kids as well as um, Courageous Kids as it relates to hospice and palliative care. I put um, both Stephanie and Robin's email addresses there, and then Dr. Dillon can be reached um, through Stephanie or our Hearts and Hands office. Um, I wanted you all to have these resources. Of course, Dr. Peterson and I are easy to get in touch with and could connect you with any of these um, as well. With all of that, I'm going to leave the last five minutes for questions. I really appreciate um, everyone who's there. I can't see the chat as yet, but um, I'm very open to any questions that may be out there. Um, and thank you. Natalie um, and Kelly, thanks so much for your presentation. I was wondering if you had any ideas as to why the fellows tended not to answer the survey as much as attending. It's Esther now. Yeah, that's a great question, Esther. You know, what's interesting, I think that we sent it out to the fellowship directors and we're and asking them to disseminate it to their fellows. So I think. That's a piece of it because as fellows come and go, it's real hard to get a whole summative list of their email addresses. And and so if you don't have a fellowship director who is vested in palliative care, and then you get are asking them to forward on the evals, um, it got a little tricky for sure. Got it. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Kim asked a question um, within the chat and said, if we were to expand our palliative care services, where do you think um, potential areas for expansion would be? Um, I'm speaking for myself, but having worked as an, I mean, you know, as Ellie said, we are not um, palliative care trained. We are um, on the job trained 
um, in this area. And I think one area that we could really support our families more is, you know, Stephanie and Christy work their tails off to see all of these patients throughout the week. But I think having um, more physician or mid-level provider support to them that could really help with some of the pain management and end of life questions would be helpful to our nursing staff and to our families. Um, also think some of the case management aspects um, that go into it could improve or decrease rehospitalization because I think if we did a good job with these families, um, they could have a lot of comfort going home with things like courageous kids that could benefit these families. Um, I would argue a lot of the research out there, um, Dr. Kim talks about child life therapists and how they do a really good job with these families um, and just making the hospital experience less scary for the children and the siblings. And then as I talked about mental health services, I think the mental health piece of it is huge. Um, and it, I think that is both an inpatient and an outpatient area that we need to work on. Um, to my knowledge, we don't um, collaborate with, so another question was the Norton adult side has a robust palliative care service that's been super busy with COVID. Do we collaborate with them? Um, to my knowledge, that has not been a place or an area of collaboration um, in the past. Um, you know, Dr. Dillon has only been with us for a short period of time and has a very um, limited time with us due to his big job through Hospirus. And so, um, to my knowledge, no. I think, and sometimes in our adult congenital patients, they could have definitely played a, a big role for us, but that is not a place we have worked with in the past. So Peter's one of our medical students who I know well, is spending the day with me in the intensive care unit. And he said, when learning about awful topics in medical school, we often were presented with panels of patients, yet I didn't see that as part of the curriculum. Is that asking too much of our families or is there a different reason for not doing that? So we've talked about that. Yeah, so Dr. Peterson said, we've, we've really discussed that in the past is how do you bring in families? Um, and we even talked about it a lot, even within giving this lecture um, to you guys about having a, one of the pediatricians and a family that we know talk. And I think both of them would have been very um, available to do so. I think one of the things, it, um, Peter, is balancing that mental health piece and like bringing up trauma that they might, we don't know where the family is in their healing process. And so if then we're asking them to come back and revisit the death of their child, it can be a tricky balance um, at end of life. If there's a lot of research out of Detroit, um, Dr. Meert in Detroit has done a lot of post-death um, and post-discharge research um, that's out there. And I think if, if you have an interest in that, her research would be um, good to read. I think when Natalie and I were designing this talk, we also identified a couple of families that um, we thought would be willing to share their experiences with us. Um, and we thought about incorporating that into this presentation, but I think um, going forward, that would be a wonderful way to expand our curriculum and, and we could use those families that we identified. And the last thing I'll say to everybody is, um, and I try to remind my trainees of this, is you're never gonna make the, the day that the patient dies any better for the family. That is always gonna be the worst day of that family's life. But if you do a good job at end of life, you can actually not make that day worse and you cannot give them worsening memories of that day and so i would encourage everyone to think about that um, when they're talking to families like you're not going to make it better nothing you do is going to make the death of their child better but you could definitely make the day worse by not communicating well and incorporating a lot of the things that could make could make that happen so thank you guys for coming um, feel free to reach out to us with any other additional questions All right, and in the interest of time, um, that will conclude Grand Rounds. I'll have them drop their emails in the chat. Thank you, everyone.